You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We're very excited to present our first Ramsey Campbell recording today, folks, and it's the classic Seven Valley Cthulhu mythos story, Cold Print. The story was first published in the 1969 Arkham House anthology, Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. The story concerns Sam Strapped, an avid reader with a predilection for lurid fiction, on the lookout for suitable material in an obscure bookshop. Artwork by the great Vishnu Prasad. We hope you enjoy this one. Cold Print by Ramsey Campbell For even the minions of Cthulhu dare not speak of Yegolanak, yet the time will come when Yegolanak strides forth from the loneliness of eons to walk once more among men. Revelations of Glarki, Volume 12 Sam Strat licked his fingers and wiped them on his handkerchief. His fingertips were grey with snow from the pole on the bus platform. Then he coaxed his book out of the polythene bag on the seat beside him, withdrew the bus ticket from between the pages, held it against the cover to protect the latter from his fingers, and began to read. As often happened, the conductor assumed that the ticket authorized Strat's present journey. Strat did not enlighten him. Outside— the snow whirled down the side streets and slipped beneath the wheels of cautious cars. The slush splashed into his boots as he stepped down outside Brister Central, and, snuggling the bag beneath his coat for extra safety, pushed his way towards the bookstall, treading on the settling snowflakes. The glass panels of the stall were not quite closed. Snow had filtered through and dulled the glossy paperbacks. Look at that! Strutt complained to a young man who stood next to him, and anxiously surveyed the crowd, drawing his neck down inside his collar like a tortoise. Isn't that disgusting? These people just don't care. The young man, still searching the wet faces, agreed abstractedly. Strutt strode to the other counter of the stall, where the assistant was handing out newspapers. I say, called Strutt. The assistant, sorting change for a customer— gestured him to wait. Over the paperbacks, through the steaming glass, Strutt watched the young man rush forward and embrace a girl, then gently dry her face with a handkerchief. Strutt glanced at the newspaper held by the man awaiting change. Brutal murder in ruined church, he read. The previous night a body had been found inside the roofless walls of a church in Lower Brister. When the snow had been cleared from this marble image, Frightful mutilations had been revealed covering the corpse, oval mutilations which resembled. The man took the paper and his change away into the station. The assistant turned to Strutt with a smile. Sorry to keep you waiting. Yes, said Strutt. Do you realize those books are getting snowed on? People may want to buy them, you know. Do you? The assistant replied. Strutt tightened his lips and turned back into the snow-filled gusts. Behind him, he heard the ring of glass pane meeting pane. Good books on the highway provided shelter. He closed out the lashing sleet and stood taking stock. On the shelves, the current titles showed their faces, while the others turned their backs. Girls were giggling over comic Christmas cards. An unshaven man was swept in on a flake-edged blast and halted, staring around uneasily. Strutt clicked his tongue. Tramps shouldn't be allowed in bookshops to soil the books. Glancing sideways to observe whether the man would bend back the covers or break the spines, Strutt moved among the shelves, but could not find what he sought. Chatting with the cashier, however, was the assistant who had praised last exit to Brooklyn to him when he had bought it last week and had listened patiently to a list of Strutt's recent reading, though he had not seemed to recognize the titles. Strutt approached him and inquired, Hello, 
Um, any more exciting books this week? The man faced him, puzzled. Any more, you know, books like this? Strat held up his polythene bag to show the grey, ultimate press cover of The Caning Master by Hector Q. Ah, oh, no, I don't think we have. He tapped his lip. Except Jean Jeanette. Who? Oh, you mean Janet. No, thanks. He's dull as dishwater. Well, I'm sorry, sir. I'm, I'm afraid I can't help you. Oh. Strat felt rebuffed. The man seemed not to recognize him, or perhaps he was pretending. Strat had met his kind before, and had them mutely patronize his reading. He scanned the shelves again, but no cover caught his eye. At the door, he furtively unbuttoned his shirt to protect his book still further, and a hand fell on his arm. Lined with grime, the hand slid down to his and touched his bag. Strat shook it off angrily and confronted the tramp. "'Wait a minute,' the man hissed. "'Are you after more books like that? I know where we can get some.' This approach offended Strutt's self-righteous sense of reading books which had no right to be suppressed. He snatched the bag out of the fingers closing on it. "'So you like them too, do you?' "'Oh, yes, I, I've got lots.' Strutt sprang his trap. "'Such as?' "'Oh, Adam and Evan.' Take me how you like, more the Harrison adventures, you know, there's lots. Strat grudgingly admitted that the man's offer seemed genuine. The assistant at the cash desk was eyeing them. Strat stared back. All right, he said. Where's this place you're talking about? The other took his arm and pulled him eagerly into the slanting snow. Clutching shut their collars, pedestrians were slipping between cars— as they waited for a skidded bus ahead to be removed. Flakes were crushed into the corners of the windscreens by the wipers. The man dragged Strat amid the horns which brayed and honked. Then, between two store windows, from which girls watched smugly as they dressed headless figures, and down an alley. Strat recognized the area as one which he vainly combed for backstreet bookshops, disappointing alcoves of men's magazines— Occasional hot pungent breaths from kitchens, cars fitted with caps of snow, loud pubs warm against the weather. Strat's guide dodged into the doorway of a public bar to shake his coat. The white glaze cracked and fell from him. Strat joined the man and adjusted the book in its bag, snuggled beneath his shirt. He stamped the crust loose from his boots, stopping when the other followed suit. He did not wish to be connected with a man, even by such a trivial action. He looked with distaste at his companion, at his swollen nose through which he was now snorting back snot, at the stubble shifting on the cheeks as they inflated, and the man blew on his trembling hands. Strat had a horror of touching anyone who was not fastidious. Beyond the doorway, flakes were already obscuring their footprints, and the man said— I get terrible thirsty walking fast like this. So that's the game, is it? But the bookshop lay ahead. Strat led the way into the bar, and bought two pints from a colossal barmaid, her bosom bristling with ruffles, who billowed back and forth with glasses and worked the pumps with gusto. Old men sucked at pipes in vague alcoves, a radio blared marches, Men clutching tankards aimed with jovial inaccuracy at dartboard or spittoon. Strat flapped his overcoat and hung it next to him. The other retained his and stared into his beer. Determined not to talk, Strat surveyed the murky mirrors which reflected gesticulating parties around littered tables not directly visible. But he was gradually surprised by the taciturnity of his table-mate. Surely these people, he thought, were remarkably loquacious, in fact virtually impossible to silence. This was intolerable, sitting idly in an airless backstreet bar, when he could be on the move or reading. Something must be done. He gulped down his beer and thumped the glass upon its mat. The other started. Then, visibly abashed, he began to sip, seeming oddly nervous. At last it was obvious that he was dawdling over the froth, 
and he set down his glass and stared at it. It looks as if it's time to go, said Strutt. The man looked up. Fear widened his eyes. Christ, I'm wet, he muttered. I'll take you again when the snow goes off. That's the game, is it? Strutt shouted. In the mirror's eyes sought him. You don't get that drink out of me for nothing. I haven't come this far. The man swung round and back, trapped. All right, all right. Only maybe I won't find it in this weather. Strutt found this remark too inane to comment. He rose, and buttoning his coat, strode into the arcs of snow, glaring behind to ensure he was followed. The last few shop fronts, behind them pyramids of tins marked with misspelled placards, were cast out by lines of furtively curtained windows, set in unrelieved vistas of red brick. Behind the panes, Christmas decorations hung like wreaths. Across the road, framed in a bedroom window, a middle-aged woman drew the curtains and hid the teenage boy at her shoulder. Hello, there they go, Strutt did not say. He felt he could control the figure ahead without speaking to him, and indeed had no desire to speak to the man, as he halted, trembling, no doubt from the cold, and hurried onward, her strut, an inch taller than his five and a half feet, and better built, loomed behind him. For an instant, as a body of snow drove towards him down the street, flakes overexposing the landscape and cutting his cheeks like transitory razors of ice, Strutt yearned to speak, to tell of nights when he lay awake in his room, hearing the landlady's daughter being beaten by her father in the attic bedroom above, straining to catch muffled sounds through the creak of bedsprings, perhaps from the couple below. But the moment passed, swept away by the snow. The end of the street had opened, split by a traffic island into two roads thickly draped with snow one curling away to hide between the houses, the other short, attached to a roundabout. Now Strutt knew where he was. From a bus earlier in the week, he had noticed the keep-left sign lying helpless on its back on the traffic island. Its face kicked in. They crossed the roundabout, negotiated the crumbling lips of ruts full of deceptively glazed pools collecting behind the bulldozer treads of a redevelopment scheme, and onward through the whirling white to a patch of waste ground where a lone fireplace drank the snow. Strutt's guide scuttled into an alley, and Strutt followed, intent on keeping close to the other, as he knocked powdered snow from dustbin lids and flinched from backyard doors at which dogs clawed and snarled. The man dodged left, then right, between the close, labyrinthine walls, among houses whose cruel edges of jagged window panes and thrusting askew doors, even the snow, kinder to buildings than to their occupants, could not soften. A last turning, and the man slithered on to a pavement beside the remnants of a store, its front gaping emptily to frame wine bottles, abandoned beneath a Hein 57 variant poster. A dollop of snow fell from the awning's skeleton, to be swallowed by the drift below. The man shook, but a strut confronted him, pointed fearfully to the opposite pavement. That's it. I've brought you here. The tracks of slush splashed up Strat's trouser legs as he ran across, checking mentally that while the man had tried to disorient him, he had deduced which main road lay some five hundred yards away then read the inscription over the shop, American Books Bought and Sold. He touched a railing which protected an opaque window below street level, wet rust gritting beneath his nails, and surveyed the display in the window facing him. History of the Rod, a book he had found monotonous, thrusting out its shoulders among science fiction novels by Aldous, Tubb, and Harrison, which hid shamefacedly behind lurid covers. Lucidismor Cinema, Rob Grier's voyeur looking lost. The naked lunch, nothing worth his journey there, Strat thought. All right, it's about time we went in, he urged the man inside, 
and with a glance up the eroded red brick at the first floor window, the back of a dressing table mirror shoved against it to replace one pane, entered also. The other had halted again, and for an unpleasant second Strutt's fingers brushed the man's musty overcoat. Come on, where's the books? he demanded, shoving past into the shop. The yellow daylight was made murkier by the window display, and the pin-up magazines hanging on the inside of the glass-panelled door. Dust hung lazily in the stray beams. Strutt stopped to read the covers of paperbacks stuffed into cardboard boxes on one table, but the boxes contained only westerns, fantasies, and American erotica, selling at half price grimacing at the books which stretched wide their corners like flowering petals, Strutt bypassed the hardcovers and squinted behind the counter, slightly preoccupied. As he had closed the door beneath its tongueless bell, he had imagined he had heard a cry somewhere near, quickly cut off. No doubt around here you hear that sort of thing all the time, he thought, and turned on the other. Well, I, I don't see what I came for. Doesn't anybody work in this place? Wide-eyed, the man gazed past Strutt's shoulder. Strutt looked back and saw the frosted glass panel of a door, one corner of the glass repaired with cardboard, black against a dim yellow light which filtered through the panel. The bookseller's office, presumably. Had he heard Strutt's remark? Strutt confronted the door, ready to face impertinence. Then the man pushed by him searching distractedly behind the counter, fumbling open a glass-fronted bookcase, full of volumes in brown paper jackets, and finally extracting a parcel in grey paper from its hiding place in one corner of a shelf. He thrust it at Strutt, muttering, This is the one, this is the one, and watched, the skin beneath his eyes twitching, as Strutt tore off the paper. The Secret Life of Wackford Squeers. Ah, that's fine, Strutt approved, forgetting himself momentarily, and reached for his wallet, but greasy fingers clawed at his wrist. Pay next time, the man pleaded. Strutt hesitated. Could he get away with the book without paying? At that moment, a shadow rippled across the frosted glass, a headless man dragging something heavy. Decapitated by the frosted glass and by his hunched position, Strutt decided, then realized that the shopkeeper must be in contact with Ultimate Press. He must not prejudice this contact by stealing a book. He knocked away the frantic fingers and counted out two pounds, but the other backed away, stretching out his fingers in stark fear, and crouched against the office door, from whose pain the silhouette had disappeared— before flinching almost into Strutt's arms. Strutt pushed him back, and laid the notes in the space left on the shelf by Wackford Squeers, then turned on him. Don't you intend to wrap it up? No, on second thoughts I'll do it myself. The roller on the counter rumbled forth a streamer of brown paper. Strutt sought an undiscoloured stretch. As he parceled the book, disentangling his feet from the rejected coil— Something crashed to the floor. The other had retreated towards the street door, until one dangling cuff button had hooked the corner of a carton full of paperbacks. He froze above the scattered books, mouth and hands gaping wide, one foot atop an open novel like a broken moth, and around him motes floated into beams of light mottled by the sifting snow. Somewhere a lock clicked. Strutt breathed hard, taped the package, and, circling the man in distaste, opened the door. The cold attacked his legs. He began to mount the steps, and the other flurried in pursuit. The man's foot was on the doorstep when a heavy tread approached across the boards. The man spun about, and below Strutt the door slammed. Strutt waited. Then it occurred to him that he could hurry and shake off his guide. He reached the street, and a powdered breeze pecked at his cheeks, cleaning away the stale dust of the shop. He turned away his face, and 
kicking the rind of snow from the headline of a sodden newspaper, made for the main road, which he knew to pass close by. Strat woke shivering. The neon sign outside the window of his flat, a cliché but relentless as toothache, was garishly defined against the night every five seconds, and by this and the shafts of cold, Strat knew that it was early morning. He closed his eyes again, but though his lids were hot and heavy, his mind would not be lulled. Beyond the limits of his memory lurked the dream which had awoken him. He moved uneasily. For some reason he thought of a passage from the previous evening's reading. As Adam reached the door, he felt Evan's hand grip his, twisting his arm behind his back, forcing him to the floor. His eyes opened and sought the bookcase as if for reassurance. Yes, there was the book, secure within its covers, carefully aligned with its fellows. He recalled returning home one evening to find Miss Whip old-style governess, thrust inside prefects and fags, straddled by prefects and fags. The landlady had explained that she must have replaced them wrongly after dusting, but Strutt knew that she had damaged them vindictively. He had bought a case that locked, and when she asked him for the key, had replied, "'Thanks, I think I can do them justice. You couldn't make friends nowadays.' He closed his eyes again, the room and bookcase, created in five seconds by the neon and destroyed with equal regularity, filled him with their emptiness, reminding him that weeks lay ahead before the beginning of next term, when he would confront the first class of the morning and add, You know me by now, to his usual introduction, You play fair with me, and I'll play fair with you, a warning which somebody would be sure to test, and Strutt would have him. He saw the expanse of white gym short seat stretch tight down on which he would bring a gym shoe with satisfying force. Strutt relaxed, soothed by an overwhelming echo of the pounding feet on the wooden gymnasium floor, the fevered shaking of the wall bars as the boy swarmed ceilingwards and he stared up from below. He slept. Panting, he drove himself through his morning exercises, then tossed off the fruit juice, which was always his first call on the tray brought up by the landlady's daughter. Viciously, he banged the glass back on the tray. The glass splintered. He'd say it was an accident. He paid enough rent to cover. He might as well get a little satisfaction for his money. "'Bet you have a fab Christmas,' the girl had said, surveying the room." He'd made to grab her round the waist and curb her pert femininity. But she'd already gone, her skirt's pleats whirling, leaving his stomach hotly knotted in anticipation. Later he trudged to the supermarket. From several front gardens came the teeth-grinding scrape of spades clearing snow. These faded, and were answered by the crushed squeak of snow-engulfing boots, when he emerged from the supermarket, clutching an armful of cans, a snowball whipped by his face to thud against the window, a translucent beard spreading down the pane like that fluid from the noses of those boys who felt Strutt's wrath most often, for he was determined to beat this ugliness, this revoltingness out of them. Strutt glared about him for the marksman, a seven-year-old boarding his tricycle for a quick retreat. Strutt moved involuntarily, as if to pull the boy across his knee. But the street was not deserted. Even now the child's mother, in slacks and curlers peeking from beneath a headscarf, was slapping her son's hand. "'I've told you, don't do that!' "'Sorry,' she called to Strutt. "'Yes, I'm sure,' he snarled, and tramped back to his flat. His heart pumped uncontrollably." He wished fervently that he could talk to someone, as he had talked to the bookseller on the edge of Goatswood, who had shared his urges. When the man had died earlier that year, Strutt had felt abandoned in a tacitly conspiring, hostile world. Perhaps the new shop's owner might prove similarly sympathetic. Strutt hoped that the man who had conducted him there yesterday 
would not be in attendance. But if he were, surely he could be got rid of. A bookseller dealing with Ultimate Press must be a man after Strutt's own heart. It would be as opposed as he to that other's presence while they were talking frankly. As well as this discussion, Strutt needed books to read over Christmas, and Squeers would not last him long. The shop would scarcely be closed on Christmas Eve. Thus reassured, he unloaded the cans on the kitchen table and ran downstairs. Strutt stepped from the bus in silence. The engine's throb was quickly muffled among the laden houses. The piled snow waited for some sound. He splashed through the tracks of cars to the pavement, its dull coat depressed by countless overlapping footprints. The road twisted slyly. As soon as the main road was out of sight, the side street revealed its real character. The snow laid over the house fronts became threadbare. Rusty protrusions poked through. One or two windows showed Christmas trees, their aging needles falling out, their branches tipped with luridly sputtering lights. Strutt, however, had no eye for this, but kept his gaze on the pavement, seeking to avoid stains circled by dog's paw marks. Once he met the gaze of an old woman staring down at a point below her window, which was perhaps the extent of her outside world. Momentarily chilled, he hurried on, pursued by a woman who, on the evidence within her pram, had given birth to a litter of newspapers, and halted before the shop. Though the orange sky could scarcely have illuminated the interior, no electric gleam was visible through the magazines— and the torn notice hanging behind the grime might read, Closed. Slowly, Strutt descended the steps. The pram squealed by, the latest flakes spreading across the newspapers. Strutt stared at its inquisitive proprietor, turned and almost fell into sudden darkness. The door had opened, and a figure blocked the doorway. You're not shut, surely? Strutt's tongue tangled. Perhaps not. Can I help you? I was here yesterday. Ultimate press book, Strutt replied to the face level with his own and uncomfortably close. Of course you were. Yes, I recall. The other swayed incessantly like an athlete limbering up, and his voice wavered constantly from bass to falsetto, dismaying Strutt. Well, come in before the snow gets to you the other said, and slammed the door behind them, evoking a note from the ghost of the bell's tongue. The bookseller, this was he, Strutt presumed, loomed behind him, a head taller. Down in the half-light, among the vague, vindictive corners of the tables, Strutt felt an obscure compulsion to assert himself somehow, and remarked, "'I hope you found the money for the book. Your man didn't seem to want me to pay.' Some people would have taken him at his word. He's not with us today. The bookseller switched on the light inside his office. As his lined, pouched face was lit up, it seemed to grow. The eyes were sunk in sagging stars of wrinkles. The cheeks and forehead bulged from furrows. The head floated like a half-inflated balloon above the stuffed tweed suit. Beneath the unshaded bulb, the walls pressed close, surrounding a battered desk from which overflowed fingerprinted copies of The Bookseller, thrust aside by a black typewriter clogged with dirt, beside which lay a stub of sealing wax and an open box of matches. Two chairs faced each other across the desk, and behind it was a closed door. Strutt seated himself before the desk, brushing dust to the floor. The bookseller paced round him, and suddenly, as if struck by the question, demanded, "'Tell me, why do you read these books?' This was a question often aimed at Strutt by the English master in the staff-room, until he had ceased to read his novels in the breaks. Its sudden reappearance caught him off guard, and he could only call on his old repost. "'How do you mean? Why? Why not?' I wasn't being critical, the other hurried on, moving restlessly around the desk. 
I'm genuinely interested. I was going to make the point that, don't you want what you read about to happen, in a sense? Well, maybe. Strutt was suspicious of the trend of this discussion, and wished that he could dominate. His words seemed to plunge into the snow-cloaked silence inside the dusty walls to vanish immediately, leaving no impression. I mean this. When you read a book, don't you make it happen before you, in your mind, particularly if you consciously attempt to visualize? But that's not essential. You might cast the book away from you, of course. I knew a bookseller who worked on this theory. You don't get much time to be yourself in this sort of area. But when he could, he worked on it, though he never quite formulated, Wait a minute, I'll show you something. He leapt away from the desk and into the shop. Strutt wondered what was beyond the door behind the desk. He half rose, but, peering back, saw the bookseller already returning through the drifting shadows, with a volume extracted from among the Lovecrafts and Durleths. This ties in with your ultimate press books, really, the other said, banging the office door to as he entered. They're publishing a book by Johannes Henricus Pott next year, so we hear, and that's concerned with forbidden lore as well, like this one. You'll no doubt be amazed to hear that they think they may have to leave some of Pott in the original Latin. This here should interest you, though. The only copy. You probably won't know the revelations of Glarky. It's a sort of Bible, written under supernatural guidance. There were only eleven volumes, but this is the twelfth, written by a man at the top of Mercy Hill, guided through his dreams. His voice grew unsteadier as he continued, I don't know how it got out. I suppose the man's family may have found it in some attic after his death, and thought it worth a few coppers, who knows? My bookseller? Well, he knew of the revelations, but he realized this was priceless. But he didn't want the seller to realize he had a find, and perhaps take it to the library or the university. So he took it off his hands as part of a job lot, and said he might use it for scribbling. When he read it, well, there was one passage that, for testing his theory, looked like a godsend. Look! The bookseller circled Strutt again, and placed the book in his lap, his arms resting on Strutt's shoulders. Strutt compressed his lips and glanced up at the other's face, but some strength weakened, refusing to support his disapproval, and he opened the book. It was an old ledger, its hinges cracking, its yellowed pages covered by irregular lines of scrawny handwriting. Through the introductory monologue, Strutt had been baffled. Now the book was before him, it vaguely recalled those bundles of duplicated typewritten sheets which had been passed around the toilets in his adolescence. Revelations, suggested the forbidden. Thus intrigued, he read at random. Up here in Lower Brister, the bare bulb defined each scrap of flaking paint on the door opposite, and hands moved on his shoulders, but somewhere down below he would be pursued through darkness by vast, soft footsteps. When he turned to look, a swollen finger was upon him. What was all this about? A hand gripped his left shoulder, and the right hand turned pages. Finally, one finger underlined a phrase. Beyond a gulf in the subterranean night, a passage leads to a wall of massive bricks, and beyond the wall rises your Golanac, to be served by the tattered, eyeless figures of the dark, long as he slept beyond the wall and those which crawl over the bricks scuttle across his body, never knowing it to be Yagolanak. But when his name is spoken, or read, he comes forth to be worshipped, or to feed, and take on the shape and soul of those he feeds upon. For those who read of evil, and search for its form within their minds, call forth evil, and so may Yagolanak return to walk among men, and await that time— when the earth is cleared off and 
Cthulhu rises from his tomb among the weeds. Glarky thrusts open the crystal trapdoor. The brood of Ihort are born into daylight. Shabna Gurath strides forth to smash the moonlands. Beatis bursts forth from his prison. Daoloth tears away illusion to expose the reality concealed behind. The hands on his shoulders shifted constantly, slackening and tightening. The voice fluctuated. What did you think of that? Strat thought it was rubbish, but somewhere his courage had slipped. He replied unevenly. Well, it's not the sort of thing you see on sale. You mean you found it interesting? The voice was deepening. Now it was an overwhelming bass. The other swung around behind the desk. He seemed taller. His head struck the bulb, setting shadows peering from the corners and withdrawing, and peering again. You're interested. His expression was intense as far as it could be made out, for the light moved darkness in the hollows of his face, as if the bone structure were melting visibly. And the murk in Strut's mind appeared a suspicion. Had he not heard from his dear dead friend, the Goatswood bookseller, that a black magic cult existed in Bristol, a circle of young men dominated by somebody Franklin or Franklin? Was he being interviewed for this? I wouldn't say that, he countered. Listen, there was a bookseller who read this, and I told him you may be the high priest of Yagolanak. You will call down the shapes of night to worship him at the times of year. You will prostrate yourself before him, and in return you will survive when the earth is cleared off for the great old ones. You will go beyond the rim to what stirs out of the light. Before he could consider, Strutt blurted, Are you talking about me? He had realized he was alone in a room with a madman. No, no, I meant the bookseller, but the offer now is for you. Well, I'm sorry, I've got other things to do. Strutt prepared to stand up. He refused also. The timbre of the voice grated in Strutt's ears. I had to kill him. Strutt froze. How did one treat the insane? Pacify them. Now, now, hold on a minute. How can it benefit you to doubt? I have more proof at my disposal than you could bear. You will be my high priest, or you will never leave this room. For the first time in his life, as the shadows between the harsh, oppressive walls moved slower, as if anticipating, Strutt battled to control an emotion. He subdued his mingled fear and ire with calm. If you don't mind, I've got to meet somebody. Not when your fulfillment lies here between these walls. The voice was thickening. You know I killed the bookseller. It was in your papers. He fled into the ruined church, but I caught him with my hands. Then I left the book in the shop to be read. But the only one who picked it up by mistake was the man who brought you here. Fool! He went mad and cowered in the corner when he saw the mouths. I kept him because I thought he might bring some of his friends who wallow in physical taboos and lose the true experiences, those places forbidden to the spirit. But he only contacted you and brought you here while I was feeding. There is food occasionally. Young boys who come here for books in secret— they make sure nobody knows what they read, and can be persuaded to look at the revelations. Imbecile! He can no longer betray me with his fumbling. But I knew you would return. Now you will be mine. Strutt's teeth ground together silently until he thought his jaws would break. He stood up, nodding, and handed the volume of the revelations towards the figure. He was poised, and when the hand closed on the ledger, he would dart for the office door. You can't get out, you know. It's locked. The bookseller rocked on his feet, but did not start towards him. The shadows now were mercilessly clear and 
Dust hung in the silence. You're not afraid. You look too calculating. Is it possible that you still do not believe? All right. He laid his hands on the doorknob behind the desk. Do you want to see what is left of my food? A door opened in Strutt's mind, and he recoiled from what might lie beyond. No! No! he shrieked. Fury followed his involuntary display of fear. He wished he had a cane to subjugate the figure taunting him. Judging by the face, he thought, the bulges filling the tweed suit must be of fat. If they should struggle, Strutt would win. Let's get this clear, he shouted. We've played games long enough. You'll let me out of here, or I— But he found himself glaring about for a weapon. Suddenly, he thought of the book still in his hand. He snatched the matchbox from the desk, behind which the figure watched, ominously impassive. Strutt struck a match, then pinched the boards between finger and thumb, and shook out the pages. I'll burn this book, he threatened. The figure tensed and Strutt went cold with fear of his next move. He touched the flame to paper, and the pages curled and were consumed so swiftly that Strutt had only the impression of bright fire and shadows growing unsteadily massive on the walls before he was shaking ashes to the floor. For a moment, they faced each other, immobile. After the flames, a darkness had rushed into Strutt's eyes. Through it, he saw the tweed tear loudly as the figure expanded. Strutt threw himself against the office door, which resisted. He drew back his fist and watched with an odd, timeless detachment as it shattered the frosted glass. The act seemed to isolate him, as if suspending all action outside himself. Through the knives of glass, on which gleamed drops of blood— he saw the snowflakes settle through the amber light infinitely far, too far to call for help. A horror filled him of being overpowered from behind. From the back of the office came a sound. Strut spun, and as he did so, closed his eyes, terrified to face the source of such a sound. But when he opened them, he saw why the shadow on the frosted pane yesterday had been headless and he screamed as the desk was thrust aside by the towering, naked figure on whose surface still hung rags of the tweed suit. Strutt's last thought was an unbelieving conviction that this was happening because he had read the revelations. Somewhere, someone had wanted this to happen to him. It wasn't playing fair. He hadn't done anything to deserve this. But before he could scream out his protest, his breath was cut off as the hands descended on his face and the wet red mouths opened in their palms. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.